I want to welcome you to Answers for Today. we got a very, very exciting program uh, to talk to you about and bring to you. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, church growth, church planting, and how that all happens. And is there a biblical model for us to follow? If you have your Bible, I would encourage you to turn to Acts chapter 2, uh, where it all began, far, uh, really the birth of the church. Again, I'm here with my good friend Chris. Uh, from Calvary Old Path in Cypress, California, and we're going to be getting right into it. So, Chris, welcome to the program, and really, church growth is uh, a hot topic, and, <laughs> boy, uh, oh boy. I, you know, I was uh, happened to be involved with Calvary Chapel for many years, and, and one of the functions that they gave me to do was uh, with my friend, Oden, Pastor Oden Fong and Pastor Paul Smith, we ran what is called with CCOF, was Calvary Chapel Outreach Fellowship, and we saw the birth and the growth of some 1,200 Calvary chapels uh, around the world. And people would come from different countries and say, how do you do this? What, what is your model? What's your game plan? And, you know, how do you make it all work? And we would direct them right back to what we're to be talking about mm -hmm. today out of Acts chapter 2. two. And I believe that if you could, for lack of a better word, the formula that was working there in the early right. church is the one that we need to be taking a look at even this day. So with that being said, welcome, Chris, and why don't you take it and give us kind of paint the background where we're at in Acts 2. You know, I'd, I'd love to be able to just say this. Um, we'll, we'll get to what he said, and I know that the, our focus is going to be in verse 42. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the important part of this, you see in verse 40, it says, And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Yeah. That was, you know, if we want to look at it in the 60s into the 70s and our perverse generation nowadays. But you probably receive the same thing that I do. As a pastor, you've got somebody who's written a book or they've yeah. come up with some kind of a program or whatever it is that will help build your church. And, yeah. and everybody's got an idea on how to do it. And uh, you and I would both look at this and say, but right here in verse 41, it says, And those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were saved uh, and added to them. Yeah. And so we know that, uh, that the addition of people to the church wasn't because of a program. It was because of the, the preaching of the message. And so for people, if they're not really immediately familiar with the context of it, Acts chapter 2 is where... After the promise that was given to them by Jesus in chapter 1, go and wait until the promise of the Father. And then uh, along comes this work of the Holy Spirit there at Pentecost. And so these people were dwelt with the Spirit. It was a, a known thing because of the miracles that began to take place and the, pro, uh, the proclamation of what was said there at the time. It was supernatural. There's no question about it. Peter uses it as an opportunity to say, well, guys, this is what Joel said would happen, yes. and he quotes from Joel chapter 2. And we, we find the culmination at uh, verse 36. It says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, mm. both Lord and Christ. Yes. And so then it says, And when uh, they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And then they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what must shall we do? Or what must we do? What shall we do? Uh, Peter said to them, Well, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Kind of like just what happened to yeah. the rest of these guys. You're going to receive the same. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so uh, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, mm -hmm. as many as the Lord will call. And you and I would fit in that category. Yeah, Those are far off. Far yeah. off. We're the Gentiles. Yeah. So that's the important part. Uh, there was the calling of repentance uh, it was a, it was to be a change of life that was to take place in them. It was uh, releasing their embrace of everything that they had embraced before. And it was to leave their religion or whatever it was that they thought was the, the way to God. It was to release their embrace of that and to embrace this Savior, this Jesus who called them to a changed life of repentance. You know, Chris, one of the things I see here in Peter's message, and then again, Peter up to this point, if you don't know his background, he was a fisherman at trade, a family business. He fished around the Sea of Galilee. He served with Jesus for three years, and he learned from the Lord. But what we see in this message and how powerful it was underneath now the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he starts quoting from the Old Testament. The mm -hmm. reason why I bring this up uh, 
there's a silly, silly new movement where people are saying is that we don't really need to study the Old Testament. We don't need to use the Old Testament. But here we see the bulk of the message that Peter gives is based out of the Old Testament, correct? Sure. He uses it as the credibility. Think about it this way. Uh, Acts chapter 9, right after Paul's conversion, he's Saul of Tarsus, and we know him as Paul the Apostle. Just the difference of, of the name of, of what, uh, what language you're using. So Paul or Saul, it just depends on are you thinking Hebrew, are you thinking Greek. So it's the same guy. But what's important is um, what it says about it, that in chapter 9 it says that he went into the synagogues and he was proving that Jesus was the Christ. Mm. But what did he have in front of him? There was no New Testament. He didn't have a pocket Bible, uh -huh. Gideon's Bible, nope. or anything. He had an Old Testament. Yes. And he had, uh, he had the, the scriptures that were common to the Hebrews. Mm -hmm. And he was able to prove that Jesus was Messiah based in the Old Testament. So I've heard the, the rationale that people will give is, as Paul would say in chapter 20, that he had never shunned to give them the full counsel. And so there are those people that would say we can preach the full counsel. Uh, based on the New Testament. But even that, that whole idea is such folly because of how much of the, the New Testament was not even written when Paul said that. Yeah. So, so much of the Pauline epistles, uh, the things that John would write, the things that, uh, that Peter would write, and uh, uh, other books that still weren't even in print when Paul said that. Yes. It's just such an absurd notion to think that somehow you say, well, there's the Old Testament and the New Testament as though they're somehow incompatible. So, so we see the, the value of preaching. They were basing it out of the Old Testament, but the central theme of Pe Peter's message was Jesus. Sure. And I think that's so important that we see that, uh, and we love quoting where it speaks about in the volume of the book, it's written of him. The volume of the book at that time, like Chris just said, was the Old Testament. And, and the net result, uh, Chris read it earlier, to you is out of verse um, 37 he says where they were cut to the heart otherwise the the king james says they were pricked to the heart or pierced their heart was pierced the holy spirit using god's word to be able to gener uh, really to penetrate people's heart and really show them their need for a savior is really what was happening there and the net result some 3,000 people were saved. Mm -hmm. And so as a, as a pastor or minister or anybody out there sharing is, is that wh what I see uh, out of here is the important is to declare the word of God mm -hmm. and to declare Jesus and sure. not to come up with some type of trick or <laughs> scheme to be able to convert people. Sure. Just share the truth and let the Holy Spirit do the work. Right? Well, yeah, think about how arrogant that is, that somebody's got some new way of doing church. And you want to say, you know what? The church did fine before you ever came along, whoever you are. <laughs> uh, the church is 2,000 years old. And yeah. so it, it got along just fine without you before you had your, you know, your book and your method and, and all that nonsense. Because, frankly, if we, if we really believe what the Scripture says, the day will come when the church would not be able to even function as we know it. Mm -hmm. or, or think about all these people with all their programs. If you try to, to make that type of church program now that people are selling, try to make it work back then. Because yeah. we've mentioned it on the program before, by the time that we get to Acts chapter 8, because of persecution, there was no more church in Jerusalem but mm -hmm. for the apostles. Mm -hmm. So it's scattered because of the persecution that Paul was looking to really finalize in Damascus by chapter 9. Yeah. So he was going to wipe out the church there at Damascus. This prior to his conversion, yes. when he was still Saul, yeah. he was a, a radical that was trying to wipe out the church as known. Sure. So church practice, the mm -hmm. way that they were functioning, this sure. is the early church, really not only the early church, but the way church should function I believe at the core of what a church should be all about is now found for us in Acts chapter 2, mm -hmm. verse 42. Let me read it to you, and then Chris and I like to talk about there's four essential ingredients. Well, I, I'd like to say five. Le let me read it to you in verse 42. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and breaking of bread, and prayer. And the key to one is they continued, and Chris is going to talk about the, how important that is. And then what were they continuing? He lists four. He says the apostles' doctrine, the uh, breaking of bread, fellowship, and prayer. Uh, of course, those are the central ingredients of the church. They should be our pillars and what we do. And he says they continue. It doesn't mean they just started and then they stopped, but they continued. 
Chris, why don't you jump in any place on this? There's so many places we could go with Sure. That. Important part of this, there are four, those four things that you mentioned, like you said. When you look at the church growth programs that you see all around you, they're heavily focused on fellowship and breaking of bread. They love doing that. So they're talking about we need to be in community. That's one of the new catchphrases, in community. That means you're around the other believers. And so they're, they're very heavily focused on all of the face-to-face, the fellowship portions of it. And right now that's an easy thing to do in America because you don't have any real limitations on that. But try to do that someplace else in the world. And uh, you do so at, at the peril of your own life. So the, the fellowship and the breaking of bread is, is a deeply personal kind of a thing, but it's based upon what you have as a, as a common knowledge and common belief, that doc, the doctrine, the didaskalia mm-hmm. is the, the Greek word here. So if we, if we really understand what's being said here and we take the time to just make the observations about this, these are the people that are being spoken of here is 2,000 years ago, needless to say. But these were the people who heard Jesus directly. They heard his teaching. They heard his warnings. They, to- they heard what he had to say about the world that awaited them. And over and over and over, he was warning them about the persecution that is coming, that they'll deliver you up. They'll think that if they kill you, that they're doing some service to God. That's the world in which they lived. And so when they gather for mm-hmm. fellowship, mm-hmm. They were talking about these sure. things, and and just as a word, we'll start here with the word fellowship, and it's the idea of a Greek word koinia. It was sharing things in common. I like it uh, to, you know, when they would sit for a meal, they might have a big bowl of soup, and everybody would break off a p- piece of bread, and they would dip it in the soup, and they would eat it, and so they all were sharing together, you know, <laughs> their soup and their germs and everything sure. else. But <laughs> it was that sharing. Nowadays, a lot of church movements, or like you said, those catch phrases they mm-hmm. have, fellowship is let's get together. They'll talk about football. They'll talk about life issues mm-hmm. and everything else. But what fellowship really means in a biblical sense is that we're sharing in common the person of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. I, I want to read to you um, out of First John, uh, if I could find it here, First John chapter 1 where John writes about what should be the basis of our fellowship, where he says that's what we've seen from the beginning, which we heard, which our eyes have seen, which we looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the uh, word of life, and the life was manifest, and we've seen and bear witness and declare unto you eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifest to us. And that's what we've seen, and we declare unto you also that we may have what? Fellowship. Uh, with you and with the Father. And so the, the whole idea and his son, Jesus Christ, is this idea of sharing in common with the, with our Father, with his son, Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit bring us in this place of communion. But then he goes on, and this is really key. He says, but if you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So the biblical thought of fellowship Mm -hmm. is that communing with each other, sharing each other, the person of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Sure, because it's all based upon our our common relationship that we have to him that gives a context for why do we get together. So um, if you don't know who Jesus is, if you haven't heard about, about who he is from the people who knew him, who he first primarily instructed, and think what we have in the scripture is exactly that that it was passed along to us from the eyewitnesses, the people who were there. So if we take it from Jesus' own words in chapter 17 of John, when he's praying for the church, he yep. says, I don't pray just for these guys, but I pray for those who will come to know me, you know, basically know us, the Father and the Son, through their testimony or through their words. Well, here we have it. Yeah. So when it comes to, if, if we want to ask ourselves, well, what did Jesus teach? What did he say? What did he do? I don't know, ask the guys who were there with him. They wrote a lot, a lot a about lot of, about him. You mentioned John, and the, the parallels that we have from his gospel to his first epistle are profound. Mm-hmm. Um, that which is from the beginning, which he says yeah. in 1 John, is exactly what you get in the first two verses of the gospel. Yes. That in the beginning was the word. Things were created by him, verse 3. Um, verse 11 tells us that he went to his own and his own didn't receive him, mm-hmm. the Jews. The, that for the, the nation did not turn to him, though his original... The followers were Jewish. So it's not the whole of the people. 
but he went to the leadership and the leadership rejected him. But verse 12, but to those who did receive him, he gave them the right to be numbered among the children of God. So Jew or Gentile alike. John is very, very compatible. First chapter of his epistle and his gospel. Uh, he became flesh and dwelt among us. Verse 14, uh, grace and truth came from him, though the law was given by Moses. Verse 17 of chapter 1. So when we hear all of those things, we remember that these are the people who were the eyewitnesses. We have their testimony and the doctrine that we hold to as believers are passed along to us from Jesus to the disciples to us through the written word. Without that writing, why do we get together to pray? Why do we get together for fellowship? Why do we break <laughs> bread if yeah. not for doctrine? You know, Chris, you, you say, and it opened up by saying if we continue in the apostles' mm -hmm. doctrine. Right. So you're saying that, that we as believers, we should be studying mm -hmm. the, the, the text so sure. we know what we believe. Right. And then we gather, we start sharing about the excitement. I see the early church when they got together because they were living underneath a sh really extreme persecution. Right. They were talking about what Jesus had to say, what the Paul had to say, what Peter had to say. And then I think that's so true for us today. Today, as we gather before the program, we start talking about what's happening in the Persian Gulf and the different things that are we see at scriptures that are about ready to happen to us. And, and that's the fellowship, like Chris was saying, is in the person of Jesus Christ and then what the, the was written to us in the epistles to help bring us that us together and to bind us together right it, it is the thing that that is so frustrating to me when i do get those again as a pastor you get them too the emails or the the things in the mail that somebody's got some brand new thing we've had big ones happen in this in, in our you know in the church in the last 15 years um uh, rick warren wrote his book the purpose-driven life and now they have purpose-driven churches and uh, you have uh, sermons that are already pre-prepared that all you have to do is plug in a few of your own little anecdotes and your personal names and whatnot like that, but it's already done for you. Well, that's not pastoring, and yeah. that's not teaching. That's not you being a partaker of what God is showing you. That's just, I've said it this way, it's like grabbing a piece of gum from under a table and chewing it. <laughs> so unfortunately, um, we're supposed to be dependent upon what God has instructed in his word. And so for all of these people that think that they've got some brand new way of doing church, the, again, they're Johnny come lately. This is a 2000 year old work. And these were the eyewitnesses. So it's much better for the pastor, the person that's supposed to be teaching to teach what is already in print and not what somebody else has seen. So you see a great value and a priority to studying God's word. The reason why I bring this up, I think it's, uh, you could correct me if I'm wrong in Acts 7, is when um, there was a dispute amongst them. They were sharing everything in common, and they decided they wanted to distribute food for the different ladies, and there was an argument sure. about who, who's getting what and how much food. Sure. And, they, and it says that the apostles, what they did there is they assigned uh, capable men that were filled with the Holy Spirit to handle that so they can give themselves com fully committed to the Word of God in prayer. Right. And so they put a high priority on the study of God's word, didn't they? Yeah, well, it was their only thing. They said they can't be concerned with those things, though they were important. Yes. And I find this to be an interesting thing, too, because uh, it's an important part for churches and, and the people that serve in ministry there. This was, some people will oversimplify it by saying it's waiting on tables. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was a bit more to it than that. But still, one, it, nonetheless, it was the, the, the Hellenists, the the. Yeah the non-Jewish believers that had kind of come into yes. faith, uh, they felt that their their uh, widows were being neglected. It's yeah. in the beginning of chapter 6. And so I find this to be such an important thing, and sometimes we don't even do this with people that serve in ministry. We will look at their qualifications, or they sh we should look at their qualifications. Look at what they said about these guys. <laughs> they need to be, as you say, filled with the Holy Spirit of good report yes. and filled with wisdom. Yeah. Well, wisdom doesn't come naturally. Where does it come from? comes from the Lord. And yeah. If you're not filled with the, with the Spirit, you're <laughs> not going to be filled with wisdom like we're thinking. And, of course, you're not going to be a very good report. That's kind of the same way of saying if you pass somebody along to somebody else and say so-and-so will take care of you, the last thing you want to see is that person roll their eyes and go, oh, goodness, not that person. Yeah. So, And then from among your, your own people so that it won't be seen like they're being, you know, there's favorites being played here. And I think that, that those are 
those are the very important parts of ministry, but they're not the the rubber meets the road ministry parts of it of you know teaching and the things that the apostles were doing. But those people had to be of impeccable uh, and, qualification, and, and they themselves would need to be studying God's mm-hmm. word. Yep. Just like every person in the body of Christ mm-hmm. is is needs to have that time where we know what the word of God says right. for whatever God has called you sure. to do. And these guys were serving table, ministering to the ladies, and that way the other guys could study in, in prayer. But yet they were preparing their lives because they need to have sound wisdom. Wisdom mm-hmm. comes from knowing God and walking with God, and that comes through his word. Sure. And, and so there's a great value of it and in studying God's word. I think of last week's program or the program before, you quoted Psalm 1, or you were looking at Psalm 1 about the man who meditates in, in the in the law of the Lord. And it goes on, he says, and whatsoever he does, he should prosper. So there's a, a great value for us as individuals uh, to, sp- to study everything that we see from sure. Genesis to Revelation because it gives us that soundness of, uh, of what we think, what we believe, and that brings forth our actions of life. Right. And so... As we see that, but then let me go back to one uh, other thing on fellowship. Uh, What John says, as we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The light that he's talking about there, you know, because light is used in, you know, all kinds of different uh, religions. Mm -hmm. As we walk in the light, what's the light that he's talking about there? Using Jesus' own words, why don't you, we can look at it this way. What he says in John chapter 8, that he's the light of the world. And if a person will come to him, they won't walk in darkness any longer. Uh, or what he says about, uh, about the church and the similitudes uh, of Matthew chapter 5 after the Beatitudes. He says a light uh, that, or a city that is up on a hill can't be hidden. And he says, you are the light of the world. Okay, mm-hmm. great. So what does all that mean? First of all, we are to radiate him. Yeah. So that. We don't have our own light. It is what comes from him. He is the light of the world. People who will come to him will no longer walk in darkness. They will have their eyes open. They'll be able to see where they're going. So same thing, that fellowship that we have with him, because he is the light of the world, as we come to know him, again, eyes are open. We're able to see things that were formerly hidden from our eyes because we were in darkness. So, I mean, he uses it as metaphor, but it's a it's a true statement because the the things that we're talking about right here, you and me, was there a time in our in our lives when we had no clue what what we're discussing right now? Absolutely. So, yeah. So then you got to say, was it because of some stellar intellectual pursuit that you and I have because we have these towering intellects or was it that God turned on the light? Mm. Well, (laughs) that's what it was with me. It changed my life. Sure. And. And when I, I get out of there and I see Chris, it's so beautiful. Like we saw in Acts 2.42, it says they continue in the apostles' doctrine. Here we say, if you walk. So it's a continuous action sure. that we're doing that should translate from the, either the pulpit you're teaching Sunday morning or those who gather and listen to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, that should translate into their daily life right. that, that it's now starting to affect them in, in that walk that we have. And sure. it, it's so beautiful. And so uh, the, what are the parts that we haven't touched on, and I want to touch on it here a little bit, is this idea of communion. Mm-hmm. And he says that we there continued in the apostle doctrine. We touched on that briefly. Fellowship. Communion. Why would that be important to the early church? Why, why is that important to sure. us? Well, communion, again, it, it can mean a couple of different things depending on what it is. Communion can be just as simple as the relationship that they have one with another. Uh, it goes along the lines with fellowship. So um, if you're going to commune with someone, there is a back and forth. There's a relationship that goes on with it. We also look at the word communion when we think of taking of the, the bread and the cup like he did in the, in the upper room. By the time that we do this now, um, we're doing it in the symbolic way of just it's a little piece of cracker and a little thing of grape juice. And that's what it's become, though the importance of it is to say, that there is a communion that goes on, and it is the the remembrance of the Lord's Supper. It's that Last Supper. But if we're just going through the motions, even if we didn't just do it the cracker and the grape juice, but we did the full food and everything like they did there, if we don't understand what took place in that upper room and why he did what he did and what he was offering to mankind at that point, the communion is based on what he offered and made available to mankind Mm 
in the symbolic way of that food. And so they would come together and they would do it as a commemoration. Remember what the Lord did with the apostles in the upper room and remember what that was. And when Jesus said that this is something that is to be done in memorial, do this in remembrance of me. Great. That's what we're supposed to be doing is coming together. The church did coming together, partaking in what was a very personal thing, a meal together in remembrance of what took place that night. You know, and it's so, so beautiful, too, is what Jesus says in First Corinthians. He says, do this until I, I come. Mm-hmm. You know, that this is something that we should, the church should be practicing. I, I know some churches that have communion available every day. Uh, we personally do once a month. I don't know what Same. you yeah, do once a month. But we gather to remember and because we have a tendency to forget, you know, forget what he yeah. does. And, and we shouldn't take it for granted. The early church didn't. The sacrifice that was paid for us. And, and I believe that even in the time of communion, I uh, like to look at the Isaiah 53 where it says, By thy stripes were healed as we see healings in communion. And there, uh, it's a beautiful time of drawing close and remembering the price that was paid. And not only the price that was paid, the glorious promise of, uh, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the new covenant that we have. And Chris, uh, you know, we have a couple minutes or a minute and a half or so. Talk to him about the communion and the new covenant. What is the new covenant that we should be focusing on? Using, again, Jesus' own words. There was a covenant that was in the past, the Old Testament, and that covenant was made, again, there, there was one made with Abraham, and it was of the land and the people. There was a covenant made through Moses, and it was the sacrificial system, and it was able to deal with the matter of sin, a covering for a time. In Jesus, he says, I make with you a new covenant in my blood. Mm -hmm. And so this covenant is one where sin is able to be taken into account but removed entirely because of his perfect sacrifice, what we think about when we partake in that Last Supper, Mm -hmm. when Jesus was talking about his body and his his blood. we are partakers of his sacrifice for us. That is the communion. That is the basis why we get together and why we can know that we have been forgiven and cleansed of sin because of his sacrifice. It's a covenant that he made with us in his blood. Wow. Yeah. So it's so beautiful, so powerful is what the things that we were looking at, what the early church was doing mm-hmm. and what we should be doing. Next program will be continuing on. I would encourage you to you know, tell your friends about it. And the beauty is, is this, this simple little four things is something that you could be doing in your home study, in your own personal life, or in a church. It, is I just would like to remind you that churches during the early days uh, 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 that we're looking at weren't, <laughs> weren't mega church like we think today. Right. They were basically house churches, and God was blessing them. And God would, would want to bless your life, too. And so until next time, this is uh, on behalf of Chris. This is Terry. May God richly bless you. And about this broadcast, or if you have any questions, feel free to mail us at Agape Chapel, O.C., P.O. Box 4023, Huntington Beach, California, 92647. Or you can email us at AFT at Agape Chapel, O.C.org. Or... Visit our website at agapechapeloc.org. Until next time.